All right. Here we go. We are going to start our hero workshop as we... Hey, Down to Die, good to see you. Uh, as we are getting going on tonight's continuation of NaNoWriMo, we talked about a lot of things so far. Last night we made our villain. We talked about what is villainy. What are, what are types of villains that exist? And now... Let's look at the concept of heroes and heroism. Hopefully the background music isn't too loud for you all. So we're going to begin by discussing heroism and the types of heroes. We're going to look at some examples. Then after we have discussed what makes a hero, in our second part, we will make the hero using resources like this and a worksheet that we have. Bloop, let me bring it up here. And we're gonna add some other little details in as well. You do not get to decide what someone else thinks is a hero, nor can you diminish it in their eyes. Well, we, we can attempt to write a heroic character because what, what you said Bane, we will touch upon. We we will touch upon that concept, so you are not incorrect. Uh, let's see. Oh, that was our villain. Alright. Let's take a look at... Here, we'll move this a little bit here. Let's take a look at some terminology, all right? Just as we did with our villains or, you know, oppositional characters. Depending on the dictionary you reference, the terminology might change up. Hero, a person who in the opinions of others has special achievements, abilities, or personal qualities and is regarded as a role model or ideal. This kind of goes in part with what Bane was talking about, you know. One person's hero is another person's villain. Um, you know, the, the truly great villains are often protagonists of their own stories kind of a thing. Uh, which actually brings us down to protagonist. By the way, in, in classical literature, heroes are usually like gods or, or like superheroes that we would see in comic books. Uh, in... in more often, you know, we see, oh, like, first responders, uh, you know, heroes, like the everyday heroes, uh, you know, police, fire, paramedics, uh, good Samaritans at the roadside, a whistleblower, uh, you know, uncovering uh, some conspiracy or something. And, and so heroism has a, a more broader modern appeal. Protagonist uh, originally started with drama as, like, the, the main character. The primary actor, the leading character, hero, or heroine of a drama or other literary work. Uh, and often protagonist and hero is interchanged. How accurate that is? Well, I mean... Mm. Pulls out the Vlad the Impaler College essay, bring on the hero definition. An anti-hero. Now, this is actually a link back to last night's villain discussion. A protagonist who lacks the attributes. You know what? I'm sorry. That Our heroic music is still kind of loud, at least in my ears. So, sorry, everyone. All right. Let's go back to our worksheet. Bring up our, our different references here. A protagonist who lacks the attributes that make a heroic figure, as nobility of mind and spirit, a life or attitude marked by action or purpose, and the like. These are these are people who might be considered to do heroic things, but maybe themselves are not ideals. They don't do it for a fame or attention, or they don't even do it to be good. The monster is killed because the monster was in that character's way. And really, there's no other reason. The person who killed the monster saved a lot of lives, but wasn't trying to. 
and would have been content not crossing paths with the monster, even still knowing that the monster could be eating the villagers. So anti-heroes can still be a form of hero, can still be featured in their own stories. Uh, we talked about uh, the Punisher being an anti-hero, and there's, there's probably other hesitant heroes that you can think of. People who might do good things but are not good people themselves. See Ender's Game says Video Goth. Deadpool says Miller. All right, Zrock, uh, be well. Thank you for hanging out. Uh, let's see. After Fob says Daniel Craig called James Bond a bad guy who works for the good guys. Yeah, you know, in, in that case, you're like, well, we don't want to have to kill people, but we need someone who's comfortable ending lives in order to try and save more than are ended. Uh, or you have, um, uh, you have a lot of people who enjoy sausage at breakfast, but they have no idea how the sausage is made. And now whether or not you consider the people at the meatpacking factory or your local butcher a hero, the fact is those are people who are doing uh, who are doing something not a lot of people may want to do, but a lot of people benefit from doing it. Uh, you might have uh, I'm, I'm sure there's there's plenty of works written about soldiers who, fall into the uh, into the anti-hero category for one reason or another. Also, characters, and this can apply to villains, but if we're going to start talking about main characters or when we get to its side characters, there are characteristics uh, to a hero, to a protagonist, where they can be flat characters or round characters. And I'm not just talking in, in bodily dimension, right? Not, not necessarily a physical presence. This is a descriptor of types of characters. Now, here's another resource. I'm going to share it with you all. If you don't already know, I, I want to share with you these, these things so you can read along, you can consider them. And you can go there on your own to research and read. We talked about foils last night. There are static characters. Those are characters. Uh, characters who are static do not change throughout the story. Their use may simply be to create or relieve tension, or they were not meant to change. A major character can remain static through the whole story. Uh, take a look at uh, Doom Guy. Doom guy in the video games is a pretty static character. And yet Doom guy is a very popular main character who does things a lot of people might consider to be heroic, not even an anti-hero, because Doom guy wants to kill the demons and save earth and do, you know, do all this other stuff. Dynamic characters change throughout the story. They may learn a lesson, become bad or change in complex ways. We get to flat and round characters. A flat character has one or two main traits, usually only all positive or all negative. They're the opposite of a round character. The flaw or strength is, has its use in the story. Often, your NPCs in a D&D game or the like will be a static and or a flat character. Welcome to Corneria. I like swords. Welcome to Corneria. I like swords. Welcome to Corneria. I like swords. And the character will always like swords and always welcome you to Corneria. Uh, they they are really just, uh, they are a rock in the river. Not that that's a bad thing, but you know the rock is there. The rock isn't changing and the story will flow around it. Uh, arguably Professor McDonagall in Harry Potter. Uh, Harry po Yeah, so... She she's pretty much uh her personality carries all the way through. 
you know, very stoic, m more austere, uh, a reserved character. There you go. A round character. These are the opposite of the flat character. These characters have many different traits, good and bad, making them more interesting. Often, your main characters, if not singular, then like the party, will be round characters. You might have an NPC guide, uh, like uh, E.T. Uh, you know, you're going through the Tomb of Annihilation currently. I believe you have a guide with you. Um, you have two guides. Okay. Uh, now, uh, you might have a companion that is just, I am a ranger. I am here to get you through the jungle. Don't talk to me. I won't talk to you. I'm simply here as a literary device to literally get you from point A to point B. Or you might have a companion, an NPC traveling with you that actually is dynamic, uh, has, has faults, finds redemption, uh, where if that NPC were to actually die or get eaten, uh, etc., well, I guess that would be dying, uh, the, the characters would actually cry or, or be upset at the loss because they really came to know this, this rounded out character. More than just, I'm here to get you through the jungle, point A to point B. Oh, I got eaten by a crocodile. And everyone's like, okay, well, my character would feel sad. Now what happens next? Right? It's almost like a, a passing thing. Then there, we have stock characters. These are the stereotypical characters, such as the boy genius, ambitious career person, faithful sidekick, mad scientist, etc. Now, all of these are, have their uses. They're n none of them are intrinsically bad or especially good. These are different types of characters you can feature in your novel and or your, your webcomic and or your novel that you're writing or whatever. But it's important to understand these types of characters, especially as the ones in the world that are more forces for propelling the hero forward through the story as the train is following the tracks of the villain, which is why we created the villain first. Now, you can read more and more and more about that at the at the link I provided here. Uh, you can go to literaryterms.net. You can read a lot of extra topics. I'd highly suggest it. Uh, consume it on your own. You can look up the definitions of things you may not understand or find other examples. But take a look at it uh, as we get into uh, as we get into types of characters that can exist. Now, characters come about in different ways. Just as E.T. was talking earlier about her character, Lena, and what compels her or why she would have a, an emotive outburst when normally she wouldn't. We are products of our environment. We are products of the world and the people around us. Uh, a, a combination uh, in some form of nature and or nurture. And understanding from whence your character came is important to writing your character. In fact, if we come over to it, we have the concept of the Delphic Maxims. I'm not talking about Maxim Magazine that you all got when you were an undergrad in college. We're talking about, you know, ancient wisdom. And one of the more popular ones that we uh, that we might know very commonly is know thyself. Know thyself. Video Gothic, you say you feel attacked, and yet if you look on your shelf, there's twelve. There's all twelve issues of that year that form a uh, a pinup along the spines. So. <laughs> Uh, so there, now there are there are the core three, right? Know thyself, nothing in excess, and surety brings ruin. And by the way, we're going to use this as a springboard. Uh, but you're going to see many more Delphic maxims here, and to an extent, this this could be uh, reduced down uh, to ten commandments, or depending on if Mel Brooks was correct, there was fifteen. But let's forget about the five. Or 
uh, you can take these and extrapolate them to the Ferengi rules of acquisition. But these are all tenets to build a character. Take sensible risks. Despise evil. Admire oracles. Respect the old. Instruct the young. Respect yourself. Die for your country. Gratify without harming. At your end, be without sorrow. Now, whether or not you agree with any of these, that's fine. You you have your agreements, your disagreements, or you just go, hey, you know what? It's interesting to consider, but, you know, I, I don't know. I don't have a lot of ancestors in my life worthy of crowning. Sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, Oracle of Delphi. Uh... Maxim 131 just is not for me. <coughs> Pardon. Now, here is the link there. If you want to check this out for yourself, take Wikipedia with as much salt as your, your mental and emotional diet can can carry for something like the Delphic Maxims. It's probably a solid read that could point you into other directions. If you want something that's not Wikipedia, um, you know, consume Wikipedia at your own risk, but I'm, I'm presenting this, uh, I'm presenting this to you as at least, Hey, here is an idea and go forward from there. But especially with Know Thyself, we need to know our character. If we're going to be playing a character, if we're going to be writing a character for literature, for comic books, or, or web comics, or whatever, we need to understand the character, and especially from whence the character has come. Not just geographically. What is going on in the world around the character, such as... Uh, that shaped that character's outlook and decisions, rationality or irrationality. And you're going to end up doing a ton of world building by considering these aspects of your main character, of the hero. Now, the side characters will add to it as well, but for tonight, we're only focused on the main character. <clears throat> now, there... Well, I mean... This is topical, E.T. This is very topical. How are how do people develop their personalities? How do they develop who they are at any point in time that we meet them? Because who they are this year may not be who they are five years, five years from now. Maybe they've changed as a person, grown as a person, or even somehow rescinded their humanity over the over the, the following five years. Which, as a side note, as a tenant of, uh, as a pillar of our community, that's why I, I want to make sure that we have a concept of forgiveness in our hearts. Because we are always learning and growing as people. And I, I absolutely abhor uh, the, I mean, for depending on how far in the future, high future people, hopefully I'm still around and can talk to you about this, but in case I'm not, here's my honest sentiment from, uh, well, it's now past midnight, so it's November 5th, 2022. But people who get canceled 10 years later for a tweet they made, who is the person now? A past is a part of the person, yes, but what were the circumstances? What was the context? So there's a couple ways that we can take a look at how people come about to become themselves. For good, for ill, for some sort of indifference. So there, there's a couple there's there's a couple things that we can we can bring up. There's a quote. Uh, in a uh, in a book, I think this was what 2016 called "Those Who Remain." Let's see, yeah, published 2016. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. 
good times create weak men and weak men create hard times. And there is actually, uh, I have a, here's a rise and fall of the Roman Empire for reference. Out of hard times, when you're scraping to survive, it takes strong wills, harsh judgment calls to just get by. People are stronger for the ordeal. Those strong people go to create robust cities and systems or whatever, that whatever you want to paint as a golden age, it will vary person to person. So I'm not here to tell you what to think or what is a hard-lined, uh, good person, strong person, etc. Uh, just as Bane said, someone's hero is another person's villain. We're only talking a concept. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. So now we're seeing the fall of Rome and now the sacking of Rome. The absolute collapse. Because now these are people who want to perpetuate the good times without making the hard decisions. And without the work, without the hard decisions, without that, society, a business, a website, uh, uh, whatever, uh, a religion, a philosophy, a political faction, whatever it is, will collapse. Now, how topical any of this is to current, you make that association yourself. I'm simply presenting... Uh, a philosophical, a literary concept to you. Because we need to think about this with our main character. Is our character born during one of these times or would be considered one of these categories of people? And you'll note that much like the seasons and many other things that exist in nature, this is a cycle. This is, as much as we want this to be an unbreaking cycle, it's never summertime forever. Unless you got a lot of money. In that case, you know, it's summertime in Ohio. You fly down to Australia for the winter and it's summer there. And then you fly back up and it's summertime. And then you go back down and it's summertime. You know, hi everyone in Australia, New Zealand. But this is the cycle that we see, where excess leads to poor decisions or a squandering of wealth and resources and reputation, and then things get really tough because everything has been in excess. Everything has been squandered. Goodwill, emotions, patience, uh, physical, like tangible wealth. This could be emotional. This could be love and the bounty of selflessness that people go through as well. Oh, I forgot to throw this one up too. Anyway, there's your Socrates. Your Socrates quote. Yeah, down to die. I I actually got some advice that the best time to visit Australia is probably June. <clears throat> so th we need to we need to consider this. Where in the cycle? And I'm not even just talking about the hero's journey, which is itself also a cycle. It is also a cycle. You will find the seasons, nature, everything, everything is uh, is cyclical, is a cycle. Gurren Lagann, it's more of a spiral in that anime, right? But it moves in circles, in cycles, things come back around. The North Pole and the South Pole flip. We circle around the sun, and our own galaxy, uh, our, our own solar system is part of a circle of a galaxy. Electrons go around, uh, you know, go around the perimeter of, of the atoms in a circle. This is a fundamental part of nature and everything. It's a circle. A cycle. 
<laughs> or if he if he got the the New York or the Joyzy accent, it's a cycle. Consider this natural cycle if you want to build a story and especially have a character existing in it that is a part of what is happening. Because it we can relate to this as those who are subjected to cycles ourselves. As much as we consider things in a linear timeline, to, you can travel in a straight line by having a rotating wheel. Why do you think pi is an infinite number, right? <laughs> so I, I won't get too much into the hero's journey. Uh, I did post a link for you if you wanted to review it. We went over it a couple nights ago. Uh, th it, this is a very good approach. And there's one more cycle that I, I want to point out to you all. Hi, Brew Froze. Good to see you. And actually, if you want a little bit of inside baseball, this is where the Hero Zone got its name. How many of you are familiar with the Strauss-Howe generational theory? Again, this is Wikipedia. If you want to read the original book, I would you know go ahead and do so. This is a theory. If you do not want to accept this theory, or, you know, there are parts of it that are probably uh, debunked or will, you know, fall outside of the general concept, you know, just like Maslow's hierarchy of needs or some other things. Um, yeah, hey, lurk and vibe away, E.T. The Hero Zone got its name from this concept. Hero or civic generations enter childhood during an unraveling, a time of individual pragmatism, self-reliance, and laissez-faire. Heroes grow up as increasingly protected post-awakening children, come of age as team-oriented young optimists during a crisis, emerge as energetic, overly confident midlifers, and age into politically powerful elders attacked by another awakening. I, I don't know if any of this sounds, at least in the West, and or if not like the West in as a broad concept, maybe the U.S. specifically. And this is probably more of a Western cultural trend. I don't know how well this might uh, translate to, uh, you know, to, to the East, but the Hero Zone got its name from this heroic generation growing up with the tabletop games that we have. Magic the Gathering, Yugi Mons, all the all the prevalent and new board games, role playing games, etc. But this also has cycles. This travels. Well, we're going to talk about Mary Sue's in a second here. This has the culture, like the, the redux of this, I'm sorry, let me take a step back. The redux of this would be the hard times, strong men, strong men, good times, good time, blah, blah, blah. That's a big condensation of this general concept where we have our generational archetypes of hero, artist, prophet, and nomad who then has a their reputation that plays out based on who came before and who's going to come after as a result of the current generation. Generation X coming after the boomers. Yielding to millennials. Yielding to Zoomers. Now, that might be kind of a redux, because a generation is about 20-ish years or so, on average, is when we see a societal shift along those lines. But we have these generational archetypes that come about because of things that have happened before, either innovations to propel us forward, correcting mistakes of the past, 
or just trying to survive in the moment with whatever is happening. These are important concepts for you to at least partially consider for any of your characters. Because all of this, all of this is a part of what forms the character. Through conformity or rebellion, through progress or a call back to the past, for ideals to pursue, or the handling of current day emergencies. We are products of this. And are any of these generational archetypes good or bad? Inherently, intrinsically, no. Because they are products of their time. And the, these are coming about because it is the time for this to happen. It is the time for this style of innovation that has outgrown what was planted in a prior generation. And that's why your character might fall into something broad like the prophet, the nomad, the hero, or the artist. If any of you are, are sitting back and going, okay, th this is, I just want to make a character. I just want a comic book character that does cool stuff and makes people happy. I got gotcha. you. You don't have to read all this extra stuff. I want to present this to you all for consideration. Okay? This is for your interpretation and your consideration because I'm not going to tell you how to think, but I at least can hope to prompt you to think at all and, and provide you direction and resources. Now, what happens if we want to have a character that just, you know, we don't want our character to die and we want our character to be super optimistic and really good and everyone loves our character and everyone, you know, our character can accomplish everything and, and even out of a selfless, like, I just want a positive role model character. That's good, right? Generally, we want to read about that sort of stuff. However, it can go a little too far and uh, and this is where we enter now the realm of, of taking things too far with the concept of the Mary Sue. This might be a term with which many of you are familiar. And if you're not familiar with a Mary Sue, I will give you some examples. Because it is super easy, unfortunately, for our characters to turn into Mary Sues. So, we're going to head over to good old-fashioned TV tropes, okay? Mary Sue is a derogatory term primarily used in fanfic circles to describe a particular type of character. This much everyone can agree on. What that character type is exactly differs wildly from circle to circle and often from person to person. Uh, I... I <laughs> I'll get the brain slug on. <laughs> so there's there's the origin of the term. Um But this comes across to the prototypical Mary Sue is an original female character in a fanfic who obviously serves as an idealized version of the author mainly for the purpose of wish fulfillment. She's exotically beautiful, often having an unusual hair or eye color, and has a similarly cool and exotic name. She's exceptionally talented in an implausibly wide variety of areas, and may possess skills that are rare or non-existent in the canon setting. She also lacks any realistic, or at least story-relevant, character flaws, 
Either that or her flaws are obviously meant to be endearing. She has an unusual and dramatic backstory. The canon protagonists are all overwhelmed with admiration for her beauty, wit, courage, and other virtues, and are quick to adopt her as one of their true companions. Even characters who are usually antisocial and untrusting. If any character doesn't love her, that character gets an extremely unsympathetic portrayal. She has some sort of especially close relationship to the author's favorite canon character, their love interest, illegitimate child, never before mentioned sister, etc. Other than that, the canon characters are quickly reduced to awestruck cheerleaders watching from the sidelines as Mary Sue outstrips them in their areas of expertise and solves problems that have stymied them for the entire series. In other words, the term Mary Sue is generally slapped on a character who is, an import who is important to the story, possesses unusual physical traits, and has an irrelevantly, uh, or, or, uh, yeah, uh, irrelevantly overskilled and over-idealized nature. Over time, a male variant started to see use. A Marty Stew or a Gary Stew wasn't isn't really that much different from Mary. Uh, and so, originally, the term used to apply exclusively to fan fiction, but by the time of Star Trek: The Next Generation, the t the term Canon Sue started seeing use. So, uh, Bane brought up, uh, Bane brought up, uh, Wesley Crusher as a form of this. And we see this in a lot of, a lot of other places where our character is always the best, always, uh, you know, always on top of things. There are no stakes. There are no loss. There are no flaws. And for as powerful and amazing as the character is, that character is boring. Because there are no stakes. There are no loss. There is no risk. That's it. That's cool. You can write a character that is like Superman. You can call Superman a, uh, a, uh, a Gary Stu if you want. In many ways, Superman's a Gary Stu. And it's, it's difficult if you write a character where there is no chance of loss or risk or because your character is so unique and perfect that there is no way for your reader to really be able to identify with any portion of that character. If you're reading a comic book and go this there's no way this character is ever going to lose. This character is never going to die. This character is probably never going to get hurt beyond like a scratch, which is going to heal by the next page. This character is has the solution for every problem. That is it's boring to read. Because despite being a a hero, a good guy, the one who's going to throw down the bad guy, doing bad guy stuff and saying bad guy things. There's no point. Because you have you have an impeachable character, an un, an unimpeachable character. And characters can be written like that out of just like self-insert, you know, fantasy. Uh, characters like that can come about even inadvertently through, uh, various societal concepts or societal pressures to any degree. The personal preferences of the writer of the studio, or if it's a character that's made by committee, the committee decides no, uh, there is no loss, there is no risk. Which then, ironically, undermines the heroism of that character. Because if we come back... A person who, in the opinion of others, has special achievements, abilities, or personal qualities, and is regarded as a role model or ideal. You might go, well, yeah, but a Mary Sue is ideal, right? Perfect in everything. Uh, half, uh, you know, my character is half demon half angel, 
half uh, uh, half Kitsune, half elf, uh, is a uh, is the head priestess of the order, but also has studied the arcane arts and graduated at the top of her class from wizard school. So she has all of the cleric spells and all of the wizard spells. And, uh, you know, uh, all her stats just happen to be, you know, 18. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to go overboard and give her 20s because, you know, I'm humble. And so all her stats are this. And, and you just go, okay, that's... I don't know. Was everything just handed to you? Or... What stakes were there for your character to earn these achievements? Were they even earned or were they just generated or given to you? What struggles did you have to go through that we, the mere common folk, need in order to use as a channel to uh, to uh, develop a rapport with the character? To develop uh, a sense of, I, I get this character. which is Which should also be a lot more than skin deep. How a character looks, you know, it, it can catch the eye, it can be important, but ultimately, what is the character of your character? What has that character achieved aside from what was just granted to them by the creator? Which could be you playing a role-playing character or writing a character in a story, so please check on this because I want you to have amazing characters with depth and not just be a pile of adjectives or a, just a gross simplification of, of what you think people might want to use to identify with your character because you're undermining, you're undermining the character and your own story. Therefore, the story that so many other people can come to love and adore and say, you know what? That was awesome. And I was along for the ride because I really, because even things that I, I didn't get at first, I came to know through that character instead of just having the character tell me these things. Show, don't tell. Show, I, I want you all to chant this with me. Show, don't tell. Show, don't, I mean, you go, wait, I'm writing, I'm telling people stuff. If you tell people stuff, that's not compelling. And usually if you got to tell people stuff, why isn't it evident? If it's not evident, broadly, why do you just have to tell people? Show, don't tell. Now, let's have a little bit of fun. You all probably saw the uh, the chart here, right? So, how to tell if your character is a Mary Sue? So here we have uh, we have a couple characters. We have Ami uh, Machida, age seventeen, green hair, yellow eyes, a Nekogen. Her mother was uh, was or is Caroline Anderson Satoshi Machida, her father. Hobbies, playing video games, drawing, going to movies, listening to music, gardening, hanging out with her friends. Not very athletic, but she enjoys playing tennis. She's in the yearbook club, makes a B-plus grade average. Secret power, the ability to turn into a cat every time she hears the Meow Mix song. If you're not familiar with that, it's, it's a jingle from a commercial. Companions, a cat named Jingles. There you go. Weakness, cries too much, can't dance, is very clumsy, and is bad at math. An interesting, believable, well-thought-out character with normal flaws, therefore not a Mary Sue. Now, you might say, I, I get, there's a lot of specialty stuff to this character, though this character ultimately would not be a Mary Sue. Especially if we look at... Name. Jasmine Rose Silverlight. Age 17, but so mature she looks older. Hair. Burnished Summer. Uh, I'm sorry, Burnished Summer Gold with streaks of sunset orange. Eyes, emerald green. Species, half Nekogen, half uh, Saiyan, half Angel, half Fire Jin, half Valkyrie. Yes, I know that's too many halves, but it's okay because she's perfect. Hero Dragon, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mother was Queen Serenity. 
Her father was Prince Vegeta. Hobbies, creating music, writing, drawing, learning, and speaking foreign languages, running, bicycling, hiking, flying her airplane, flirting with all the boys who have a crush on her, exploring Mayan ruins, traveling, race car driving, scuba diving, and flower arranging. Wow! Sports, soccer, basketball, tennis, archery, polo, softball, volleyball, swimming, golf, badminton, bike racing, gymnastics, and ballet? She's so perfect! Oh my, Kokoro's going doki doki! Drama club, art club, math team, cheerleading squad, computer club, poetry club, cooking club, multicultural club, gardening club. Her GPA is A+, plus, of course. Secret power? Can fly, teleport, create fireballs and phoenixes, changes weather, can change into and summon any animal, creates galaxies, telepathy, has a key of 30 bazillion bamillion, can talk to unicorns, and cannot die. Now, that that's that's balanced out because it is. I you just believe me. Like, oh, but she can only do one thing at a time, right? You know, like so my my character is balanced cuz she can only do one of these things at a time. Companions, unicorn, tiger, wolf, dragon, and everything else. Weaknesses, um what? So, as much as you might start going kind of cringy with this character, this character is not a Mary Sue. This character is very much a Mary Sue. Now, where is this line? We can get into into the philosophy of the heap paradox, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how many grains of salt can you, uh, you know, drop until it creates a heap? Is it 100? Or is it not a heap until 101 grains of salt? But in comparison, we do not have a Mary Sue here, and we have a Mary Sue here. And yet, can many of you think of perfect, untouchable characters? You know, they can't die, they can't be hurt, or even if they can be hurt, like, oh, you know, she she can be hurt. Or he. He can be hurt. He's almost dying in this one chapter, but then he slept for a night, a whole night of not doing this stuff, and he got better and learned a lesson and is going back out as a, a wiser, stronger hero. In fact, he's even stronger for almost dying. That's character development, right guys? Right? This one's tough to see. I'm Sephiroth's daughter and Maleficent's niece and 300 years old and my entire family died in a terrible accident and this is my Keyblade, Midnight Crescent Nocturne Scythe Star, because OMG, I'm a wielder just like you and Riku and... I want to instill in you all that it is absolutely fine for your character to have flaws and vulnerabilities, emotional or physical, because that creates compelling characters. I can identify with your characters if there are things like, oh, I get, I can be hurt by, you know, trains also. I am not immune to bullets, unlike Superman. I cannot identify with Superman in that, in that regard. And we're talking about like true, like not just the topical look of a character. We're talking about who the character is. The nature of the character's character. You can have a character that topically might appeal to an interest or a, a surface look because you like cat girls. But being a cat girl itself is not really compelling that is just a topical aspect it's, it's an adjective of the character not necessarily who the character is and I want you to focus on that I want you to write a compelling hero someone who can get hurt and in your case ET someone who has an irrational emotional lash out 
because of something that happened in her past. Because it's okay if that happens, because that happens to us. I feel embarrassed when I when I do irrational things, but they also happen. For as much as I'd like to think I'm logical and patient and can think things through, there are times where I'm listening to the news or something has happened in the store or just, you know what, that day, the universe and all its cycles have lined up to absolutely poo on my day. And it sucks. And I hate it. And afterwards of, you know, after I piss and moan and I, you know, I actually might feel embarrassed afterwards. And seeing that kind of vulnerability in a character, and that type of a character can be an elf, a Nekogen, that type of character can even be a half-angel, half-devil. That character uh, can have any skin color, can have any of these other whatever. Like, okay, so th that's a part of you, but I can, uh, all through that, I can identify with who you are because you also are having a super bad day and it crushes your soul to feel that way. And I can actually feel feelings for your character, despite similarities or differences that are topical. Because you are a product of your time. In a generational cycle. Or in a societal cycle. Or a combination of both, where things have lined up. Because maybe maybe your parents did have a, a terrible accident and you're an orphan. That alone does not make you a compelling character. Is it tragic? Yes. Are you doing anything with that tragedy? Has it has it become a part of your character in a compelling way that even with me not being an orphan, can I understand? some of your frustrations, your strengths, and your weaknesses? Or even as an orphan, I would be insulted if I had a character that, oh yeah, this you know, this this comic book is totally making an orphan character, and then it's just there for advertising, or it's there for just throwaway, you know, throwaway notice points. Because I lost my parents, and I know what it feels like and this person who's writing about it treats it like an eye grab. Treats it like a, 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 a hashtag. Or something. So understanding this stuff is important. And I want to stress, especially heroes are heroes. When they do the heroic things, they get their achievements because crap happens to us all. And this is what defines us as human beings in real life, as, as, as well your characters that you write about for your comics, for your campaigns, for your novels, for your video games, or whatever. How do you overcome the consistent stream of cosmic poo that is landing on us all through circumstance, consequence, or whatever? That is what will define your character, both as a human being, but also as a fictional character, as a hero. We get it. Life sucks and bad things happen that you didn't ask for or earn karmically or by your own just going out of your way and doing it. You know, the play stupid games, win stupid prizes kind of a thing. Because sometimes bad things do happen to good people. And it's how do we deal with those situations? How do we deal with the loss of a family member to cancer? Either that happened to you or it didn't, but there's also characters who are going through this struggle and feeling of loss. How do you overcome that? Even if it's in, uh, if it's a situation where there is no other outcome but death. That is where we find compelling stories in real life and in fiction in our fictional writing. Because people can give up and give in, and there's not a lot of interest in that. Because where's the story? There's no struggle. 
it's just acceptance or it's uh, or it could be considered uh it, you know in in the cycle weakness you know weakness of character or weakness of society okay what's the i get it i'm i'm already surrounded by misery and you're just telling me a story of giving into misery what what am i supposed to do with this so understanding these cycles and understanding these broad concepts will help you write your character and especially forge a potent hero who does the things that he or she does. And for it, for all of the negativity and the disbelief and for uh, what's the, the, the quote from Shawshank Redemption, speaking of fiction, right? Andy Dufresne crawled through like whatever, like 500 feet of filth to come out as a as a clean man on the other side. In that story, th that's an interesting story to, to follow the the character arc of Andy Dufresne, by the way. But uh, you have someone who is constantly just in a, a system of bad. and worked through it and that creates a compelling story Shawshank is probably one of my 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 top movies that I really really like but do you want to read a story about a you know a half angel uh half demon half uh half neko half genie half uh whatever uh who can fly and teleport and uh, it has fire power and ice power, but it's it's balanced because she can only use one of those powers at a time. And also, um, you know, it's balanced out because despite having unlimited magic, she's no good with computers. Just, oh, come on, you know? And who can't get along without computers? Except the whole story, everyone caters to her because they realize she can't use computers. So the entire world actually revolves around that and not being computer savvy, Play, has an irrelevancy, right? It's irrelevant to the story. And so you're like, oh, it's a weakness, though. She, she She's no good with computers. You know, no good with technology, and then everything just resolves through magic anyway. Okay. Gotcha. Hi, Zeta. Good to see you. Anyway, I was on a bit of a soapbox. A lot of chat has happened. <laughs> I'm sorry that I, I missed out on uh, uh, on a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. So uh, if I'm sorry if I ruffled anyone's feathers, uh, hopefully I didn't step in anything that was uh, too terribly controversial in my impassioned outreach for you all to develop your characters, especially your heroes to shine brightly against the darkness of the villainy and everything else that we're setting as the backdrop so we can put the spotlight on your hero and really have your hero shine even through the bad times to take us through the moral decisions and to take us through the, the hard decisions that your, your hopefully strong character will make. Uh, Sierra Echo says, so do we have a session for straw man arguments on character design? I, if that's if that's something you want to talk about, Sierra. When a hero is so overpowered, they will never suffer any consequences of a bad choice because they simply can't make one. Zeta, I'm doing well. I, I, I'm wrapping up this topic. Uh, Sierra, I, I, I hope that was... Uh, that, that was a fun ingest, or if, if you think that I went off the rails, please let me know uh, with the examples I was putting forward about uh, character development, understanding the uh, interior, the know thyself of your character that you're writing, or about the world in which your character lives and will work through 
uh, as a, you know, a product of the current circumstances, moving into whatever the future of the next, the next iteration, the next cycle to come for the world in which your character exists. I have an idea for a story, says After Fav, where the main character has mega superpowers and is completely invulnerable. He doesn't become a superhero or a supervillain. He just doesn't care. He doesn't need to. Yeah, you just like sit around and I don't know. You watch TV and eat, eat food. You know, you just you you live in your best life, just kind of jamming out, right? So, we went. Yeah, you sit around. And I'm assuming it wasn't you, but the comparison page between Mary Sue versus not Mary Sue was heavy handed. It it was it was providing extreme examples. And uh, I did not make that, Sierra, but I brought it up to show to show uh, a great disparity in character. And I also talked about where do we draw the line in between. And it gets into the whole concept of the heap paradox about, you know, when does when does a pile of salt become a heap of salt? Is it at the thousandth grain or the hundredth grain? Or if not at a thousand, is it a thousand and one? So they were two wildly different takes, and then somewhere in between is the line that gets crossed. So, the the for the Mary Sue examples, uh, it it is a straw man, because there is uh, we we hope to not run across Mary Sue style characters, because they are not as invocative or or the, actually Mary Sues for all the adjectives they have are probably more flat characters because there's not really development. There's nothing really that changes because nothing can or needs to. And flat characters play a role, but maybe they, they're not as interesting a person to follow through a story. Um, we went into into uh, a little bit Superman. Uh, I believe Superman was brought up last night about, I mean, really what's compelling about Superman. It really is more about his moral judgments because he is perfect in all these other ways. There's a couple weaknesses, but really it comes down to the decisions he makes with the powers that he has that provides for the compelling storytelling. Because otherwise, what? He's never going to lose a, a race. Uh, he's never going to like not fly around. He's never not going to use his powers as they're needed to the extent that they're needed per se. So it's more about his personal decision making to try and give us something to attach on to to say, you know what, this is, you know, the, the character's strength, it's physical, but it's not the physical strength we're really concerned about. It's the strength of his character, of his morals, which goes on to tell compelling tales of, we have a super strong hero who's perfect in a lot of ways or is just completely so superhuman that it, it alienates him from everyone else in the world. And, and how, do, how, how do you live a life like that? And that's where the interest can come in a Superman story. So, yeah. So, Sierra, I, it, it very much could be a straw man in that regard. Um, hopefully I didn't upset you <laughs> with that point. But uh, th that, was, that was the take to try and provide an example for consideration. A thing for your game... Uh, it, I believe it was your finds we were talking about. Yeah, just sit around and vibe, BT, like One Punch Man. Rufra says, well, I just got to say hi quickly and got drawn into the conversation. How does that happen? Have a good night. Well, I'm glad we were compelling for you, Brufros. I know someone who has a near-perfect high school record, graduated top of the class in all sorts of honors, looked through this person's old school records. They cheated a lot. Nope. No, so there's that too, right? I've really been thinking about this, and I've come to a conclusion, says Bane. And that conclusion is... Can't do this for much longer. It hurts the tips of my fingers. I'm going to bed! All right, Bane. Thank you very much. 